well, thank you very much, and thank you to, uh, uh, to all of you for making it through dinner and all of the wine and uh, for giving me some attention. Um, thanks again for, for, for Patrick uh, for, from Zuri Invest for inviting me. When he asked me to speak um, this evening, I said to him, well, what do you want me to talk about? So he gave me a very long list of topics and said that I should try and keep my comments to maybe less than two hours. <laughs> the good news is, is that I haven't done that. So I've got a very long presentation here of about five topics. I'm only going to give two of them. I'm aiming to be finished in 25 minutes. All of the information that I would have spoken about is contained on our website. Um, of the World Gold Council, which is www.gold.org. Um, registration is free. All of that information is there. But I'm going to talk about two things tonight. I'm going to talk about a strategist perspective on what's going on in the gold market at the moment, where we're positioned, what's driving it. And then because Patrick asked me to, I'm going to, ask, I'm going to talk for a little while about probably the biggest story in, 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 in the gold market in the last 18 months, and that's what central banks have been doing with gold as well. At the end, we'll have time for questions as well. So, a strategist perspective. In the long term, the fundamentals of supply and demand, so in other words, how much gold is being produced by miners, how much demand is going into India, into China, the development of the ETF market, that's the biggest drivers of the gold price. But in the short term, it's much more about macroeconomic factors, particularly US macroeconomic factors drive the gold price in the short term. Now, we're busy putting together something, what I've called a grand unified theory, which will, with solid economic and, 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 uh, and, and macroeconomic theory, integrate these whole things where we can explain all of the movements and offer some tools that will allow people to forecast where the gold price is going to go. I'm not going to talk about that today. That's something for later this year. But do keep your eyes open for it because it's really exciting. This short discussion is focused on the shorter term drivers of gold. What's going on at the moment? Why are we where we are? And what could actually influence it going forward? So I put this, um, this chart together yesterday. For those of you that follow me on Twitter, and I am very active on Twitter, I later complained that as the gold price went up in the afternoon, it was with the main intention of making me look stupid and out of date today. So gold's trading about $1,308 an ounce at the moment, but it's fair to say it's consolidating above $1,300 an ounce. And that's generally how we talk about the gold price. We all talk about the gold price in dollars per ounce. It's not the only gold price, though, and I pay a lot of attention to how gold is trading in other currencies. So look, very messy graph here. It's been re-indexed in May, and I did that for a reason, because that was at just about the point when gold started to decline through the summer of last year. The red is the dollar gold price. And you can see that the dollar gold price has got back to more or less the same levels that it was before that decline. Gold in other currencies, though, has done much better. And, and I think that's really important. We talk about a, dollar, uh, uh, sorry, a, a bull market in the gold price, not just when the, the gold price in US dollars is going up, but when the gold price in other currencies is going up as well. And I think the fact that we've managed to recover from those summer 2018 lows, and that the dollar gold price is doing OK, but gold in other currencies is strengthening a lot, I think is really important. And something, I think, that, 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 that may be the beginnings of something more exciting. So where are we now? We've got, I, I think, a dichotomy, a tension between macroeconomic outlook versus US equity strength. Now, the macro outlook is beginning to, to show, I think, really quite positive signs for investment in gold. We're seeing a slowing global economy. We've seen a very long economic recovery in the United States, which is beginning to look mature. We've seen a Federal Reserve which has stepped back from a hiking program and stepped back from a balance sheet reduction program into a much more dovish stance. But on the other side, we've seen US equities recover. And one of the first things I learned about gold when I, when I was speaking to a fund manager 
a very long time ago, Sean Boyd might have just become um, a CEO of Agnico at the time, was, he said the most important thing to, bear, to look at, he said, was look at the gold price and look at the performance of the US equity market. When the US equity market is strong, the gold price will be out of favor. I'll come back to that a little later. So my point about the global economy, I was looking for chances as I was putting this presentation together, so I'm very pleased I've developed a new one um, taken from the OECD, and it's a composite uh, leading indicator. So in other words, they take all the data that they can get about the global economy or the economies of the OECD countries, put it together, uh, and try and develop a series which helps them give a leading insight into where the economy is going. As you can see, we've now declined to levels that we haven't seen since the financial crisis. Now look, if you compare it to the, the depth of the financial crisis in 2009, 2010, everything looks fine in comparison to that. But if you remember, we've had a couple of what they call mid-cycle slowdowns since the, since the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the great financial crisis. Uh, back in 2016, for example, but the, the decline that we're seeing now in economic indicators around the developed world is worse than any of those uh, and probably points to uh, some sort of big global slowdown, potentially a recession coming. That's probably going to be positive for, for investors in gold. I mentioned before the Federal Reserve turning much more dovish. I used to run a chart like this. This is taken from Bloomberg. It's a probability of, uh, of where interest rates will be in the United States, uh, in this case, uh, at the end of 2019. Now, for the last two years, I've been showing this chart and saying probability of hikes, probability of two hikes, three hikes, four hikes. As you can see, we're now talking about probability of cuts because there are no rate hikes priced into the curve in the United States. You can see when the Fed turned dovish back in March, now people, now people, markets, traders, are beginning to expect uh, at least a 25 basis point uh, cut by the Fed. Again, the Fed's indicating to us that the economy isn't strong enough to cope with even modest interest rate increases from the levels that we're at at the moment. Real US interest yields uh, have also uh, declined a lot. So the green line on here, which is upside down, generally speaking, um, when we see a decline in real interest rates, that's good for the gold price. Now, a big gap had opened up in this market between where the gold price is in red and where yields were in green. And what we've now seen is that we've seen real US interest rates have declined uh, substantially. That's basically a saying that the long-term growth rate of the economy um, or the expectations of the long-term growth rate of the economy have declined as well. Another factor that's positive for gold. The other thing that's happened as well, which I find really interesting, and, and in a way this is the same as my multi-currency gold price chart, is if you look at the gold, uh, if you look at the gold price uh, here shown in red, that's recovered quite nicely from November. If you look at the US dollar, which I've shown as the DXY index, again turned upside down because normally these, things, these two things track very closely, you'll see the dollar is actually relatively strong at the moment, and yet the gold price has managed to, to increase. And I think that's a clear sign that safe haven investors have come back into gold in some ways. Because I expect, because of the concerns about the, uh, the global economy, because of the concerns specifically about the US economy. And we've seen that as well in the holdings of exchange-traded funds in physical gold. If you look at how investors, after selling gold in the summer, back in, as you see up there, where it says July 2018, we saw outflows from the 78 uh, ETFs we track around the world. They've turned around and started buying gold in the, in the fourth quarter of 2018, and on balance, have bought gold uh, in the first quarter of 2019 as well, particularly in January and then to a much lesser extent in March. Back in the, the summer of last year as well, we saw speculators on the COMEX futures market with very large short positions in gold. Those short positions have been neutralized. We've seen those shorts covered. That's been one of the factors that's helped the gold price uh, recover from its lows of last summer. But as you can see as well, those positions are fairly modest at the moment. I'd argue that's a very positive thing. 
Somebody mentioned before that the, the big level in the gold market is $1360 an ounce and that we need to break that to get excited. Well, perhaps, but we need to be careful what we're looking for as well. If we break $1360 an ounce only because these short-term fund guys have piled into the gold market, then I wouldn't get too carried away because what they buy, they then turn around and sell. I get worried when uh, investors, or sorry, speculators on the futures market amass long, large long positions. The fact that they're neutral at the moment, I think is quite good. But this was the point I was making. I, I, I wrote on something, uh, one of the blog posts I put out, talking about the nightmare before Christmas for equity investors. So you will remember, 24th of December, we were all on holiday looking forward to uh, eating as much turkey as we could stick down our throats. And share prices were crashing, particularly in the US, particularly with tech stocks. For the next month or two, it looked as if this correction or this sell-off that we'd seen was something more serious. But where we're at now, I think the last time I, I, I looked, we were within half a percent of the all-time highs in the S&P 500. So we've seen a really decent recovery in equities. And I think that explains why we haven't seen the follow-through in gold that you would expect if people were turning, into, turning to this uh, as a safe haven. Because going back to the sort of the first rule of investing, particularly from a US perspective, you buy gold when you're worried about the performance of other things in your portfolio. And if you look at your portfolio at the moment, you're more or less back at all-time highs. Other signs in the market also calming down. Implied volatility in, well, we've all heard of the VIX, and you can see how spiky that got, uh, particularly uh, in December, heading back towards low levels. Other asset markets not showing any concern. Similarly, the credit market spreads. Uh, this is a, a Barclays US corporate high yield uh, spread, again retreating. Similarly, money market stresses, which again got quite excited in December, coming back. So everything the financial markets are telling me at the moment is the panic, the fear, the worries that we had in December particularly have abated. So what does the Fed know? Why has the Fed turned so dovish? What's the Fed worried about? My concern for the economy and my potential excitement towards gold is the Federal Reserve has, has recognized that this recovery that they've got is as long as it's, uh, as long as it's been in history, that the uh, um, interest rates have reached a level where when the Fed is hawkish, it threatens the markets, it threatens the economy. All they can do now is stay dovish and hope things continue uh, in the, uh, the economy continues to grow in the way that it does. We're re reaching a situation with you know, things like leading indicators slowing down, looking at house prices, looking at car sales, looking at all measures of, of, of economic activity in the developed world. We're coming to the end of this recovery. So I think gold is nicely poised here. 2018, the strength that we saw in US dollar assets that dominated the market has uh, put gold, pr gold prices under a lot of pressure. We've recovered from those lows. Those safe haven flows that we saw, though, have slowed down as US equity markets have recovered. Now, as I've said, the equity market backdrop, sorry, the macroeconomic backdrop does suggest that this equity bull market is mature. And, and what we're saying to investors uh, institutional investors in gold, or potential institutional investors in gold, is this is an excellent time to consider portfolio diversification into gold. And particularly when we talk to US uh, institutional investors, they're now getting a second chance. You had the correction in December which showed you what could happen to markets, but now equity markets are back towards levels that they were at the highs. This is an opportunity now that you, get a, that you get to revisit your portfolios in another way. Now, we don't at the World Gold Council make forecasts about the gold price. What we do, though, is make the case for gold and diversification. That's later in this presentation, which I'm not going to give you, but it is all there on our website, or I'm happy to take it on questions. What I do want to talk about briefly, after a sip of water, is about the central bank story. Because the central bank story in gold has probably been the most surprising and strongest story we've seen over the last 18 months. So this is our waterfall diagram of, of the, the gold market in 2018. 
and it shows basically the 2018 demand, 2017 demand, and the positives and the negatives that, that, that took through. So if you look at the green bars, we had a small increase in total bar and coin demand, 45 tons. Um, we had a tiny increase in technology demand of two tons. Uh, jewelry demand was off by, uh, sorry, uh, by a ton. And ETFs and similar investment products off 137 and a half tons. Overall number, plus 185 tons for the year. Where did that come from? The increase from central banks and other official institutions, a whopping plus 276 tons of demand year on year. And looking at that demand in absolute terms, 651 tons of gold demand last year out of about a 4,300 ton market. That's the biggest amount of gold that central banks have bought since the end of the gold standard. Since when, when president, I couldn't get president in there, I apologize to any Americans, and I couldn't get gold, so I can't say gold window, but, but President Nixon closed the gold window, in other words, the convertibility of the US dollar for gold back in 1971. This is the biggest gold demand we, uh, we've seen from central banks since then. We've seen more diversity or the diversification, yeah, diversity of purchases from central banks uh, in 2018 versus previous years as well. Yes, Russia was still the biggest buyer, but there were 18 central banks that bought gold last year compared to, to only 12 in 2016. And crucially, we've seen China come back to the market. It's now reported that it's bought gold for the, for the fourth consecutive month in March. Um, so bought December, January, February, March, after an absence of about two years. We've seen purchases coming through from countries that we really wouldn't have expected, like Hungary and Poland. We've seen India coming back to the market and buying gold as well, and that hasn't happened since the IMF sold back in, 19, uh, in 2009. So lots more purchases coming in to the market. And one of the things I'd say about central banks, having spoken to them for years, firstly at my career at UBS, but also now, of course, at the World Gold Council, is they're a bit like fund managers. What they really want to know is what their competitors are doing. So this does become a more self-reinforcing phenomena as well. And we're very interested with the conversations that we're having with central banks who are not buying gold at the moment, who are having the same sort of conversations with us that central banks did, that did buy gold last year, a couple of years before. So it's very interesting going forward. So what's driving this current central bank demand? There's not one simple answer. Um, and we've got five of them uh, that we've laid out here. Uh, and I'll talk through some of these uh, in slide form. I mean, the first thing is, is, is a rebalancing phenomena. If you look at the growth in, uh, in overall central bank foreign exchange reserves over the last, what is that, 18 years, you see the red lines have gone up a lot. Um, they haven't gone up much, actually, since about 2012, 2013. But if you look at what the gold price has done over that period, the gold price has declined a bit. So we're getting to the stage where the proportion that gold is made up of central bank foreign assets has declined somewhat. That's encouraging just a, a mathematical rebalancing from the people that own gold and pay attention to that. So certainly that's part of the story. Another way of looking at that, if you look at the bottom chart there, you can see the proportion uh, of, of central uh, sorry, gold share of total uh, central bank reserves certainly has declined from where it was at the beginning of this period. And also uh, with that decline we saw in the price in 2013. The second thing is, seems to be a movement an explicit movement away from the US dollar from some central banks. Now, we've seen statements from, uh, from some. Russia is a, is a case in point. They have virtually eliminated their holdings of US treasuries um, because they've, they've said they don't want to be dependent on the US dollar and the US uh, dollar payment system. At the same time, they have been adding to their gold reserves and certainly, uh, they bought more last year than they've bought uh, in this whole process of, uh, of addition. It's not just Russia as well. Um, and when we speak to central banks and ask them, um, you know, what's behind this, or if we listen to what politicians are saying in the press, it seems very clear that the, the US administration's use of the dollar, and particularly the dollar payment system in potential sanctions, is worrying some countries and worrying some central banks. You don't want to have 
all of your foreign exchange reserves in a currency that you may not be able to trade if you fall out with President Trump. Um, and, and I think, you know, as, as crazy as it seems that, 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 that some countries think that they, they won't be able to use the dollar payment system, it is explicitly having uh, impacts in terms of central bank purchases. We're also seeing the re-emergence of gold as a strategic asset. So the conversations we have with central banks, they recognize that we're in a higher political risk environment. Uh, I'm not just talking about Brexit. Um, we're looking, obviously, at the makeup of the, uh, um, uh, or, or the attitudes or the tweeting habits of, uh, of the US president. We're thinking about the behavior of some countries within the European Union, uh, some in the center, some at the periphery, perhaps. We're thinking about other countries as well. Generally speaking, the Global Economic po uh, Political Uncertainty Index, which uh, is uh, available to you on Bloomberg and can give you some sleepless nights if you want to, has been ticking higher. And I think this has been playing a role in central banks looking at gold as well. There are structural changes going on in the international monetary system as well. Some of the conversations that, that we've had, some of the, the, the readings we've had with, with, um, um, with uh, academics is suggesting that the US dollar, which is effectively the reserve currency of the world at the moment, won't be the reserve currency of the world forever, particularly if you look at you know, the size of the China economy, if you think about the, the growth rate of the China economy. Um, it, it makes sense that we're moving towards a more multilateral world in terms of reserve assets, um, and that uh, the dominance of the dollar, which has really existed since the Second World War, is coming to an end. I'm not saying that the dollar is going to fall out of the reserve system, but it won't be the principal asset that's in there. It'll be once one of another, or one of a number. Now, one of the things about China is, as a central bank, you can buy, uh, you can get access to RMB. Um, the, the People's Bank of China make, allows you to buy RMB if you're a central bank, but it's not exactly a liquid market. And you know, the liquidity issues, if you ever wanted to sell this, are a bit worrying. So one of the things that, 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 that seems to be happening is countries are looking and saying, OK, we know that the dollar isn't going to be as important in the reserve system going forward. So we want to sell some dollars. What do we want to buy? Well, the euro has its issues. The yen has its issues. I'm not going to talk about sterling. Gold actually isn't a bad place to get away from the dollar in an environment where we know we're going to be moving away from it at some point. Even if we, you know, even if, the, if gold is a, a halfway house, shall we say? So I've tried in this presentation to talk a little bit about what's happening in the gold market. I've tried to talk a little bit or explain a little bit about what we see is happening with central banks. I've got loads more slides which I'm not going to go through. I'm more than happy uh, to take uh, questions uh, if you have anything on the gold market. Um, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>